be speaking on the main topic for today. Um, just to let you know what we're looking at today. Um, so we're starting a little bit late, five minutes late. I apologize for that. Um, we are going to be looking at decolonizing, decolonize, decolonizing, apologies, the curriculum. Um, we're going to look at the main topics. What is anti-racism? What is decolonization? We're asking some critical questions about old texts that you might have taught already and thinking about inclusive classroom practices. Um, just a little bit about the organization who's presenting today. So um, SAIT is the Scottish Association for the Teaching of English. Um, we're part of the National Association for the Teaching of English, which is a UK wide organization. Um, we're trying to promote and um, focus on inclusive approaches which center on the child and the literacy and interests of children, their own language rather than maybe imposing ideas upon them, which hopefully is a great fit with our event today. Um, really quickly, um, to introduce our two speakers today, um, Navin is a lecturer at the School of Education at the University of Strathclyde, and he works on critical literacy. Um, he's currently working to understand critical literacy's role in Scottish English language and literacy education, as well as an in initial teacher education. So a fantastic fit for today. Um, our second guest is Melina. Uh, Melina is a Franco-Indian teacher of English in a secondary school in Glasgow and a committed anti-racist activist. Um, she's the co-founder of the Anti-Racist Educator, which is a Twitter account and a series of events and a website, which we will give links to at the end. And is also a board member of the Scottish Association for Minority Ethnic Educators, which supports people of colour in Scottish education. Um, she's got a background in research and in teaching, so it will be obviously very interesting, interesting when we talk to her in a moment. Um, I'm going to bring them in just in a second. Um, so uh, we've got the links later on. Um, we're hoping to have a formal question and answer session today at um, quarter past 11. So we might not quite manage that, but if you do have questions, please leave them in the comments on Facebook Live or Google Live, and we will get to those if it's appropriate during the session, but probably towards the end of the session. Hopefully you'll be able to answer most of your questions, but if we can't, I'm sure both of our guests um, would love for you to uh, talk to them on Twitter, um, send them an email um, through their different accounts, um, or leave a comment under the video. And if you're watching this back, because this will be recorded, then I'm sure you can ask comments and uh, you can ask questions rather in exactly the same way. Okay, so I am gonna bring um, Nav and Melina in just now um, and have us all together. Hello Nav, hello Melina, how are you today? Fine, thank you. Hi, doing well, thank you. Yeah, it's great to see you. So um, you guys are both uh, Skyping in basically on this this new technology, which we all uh, have got used to over the last wee bit of lockdown. You're both coming in from Glasgow at the moment? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm going to do the boring conversation. It is really, really raining here on Sky. How is it where you are? Pretty grey. Not raining yet, but <laughs> it's not quite a sunny summer day either. <laughs> no, it's a shame. Yeah, it's a yeah, nice and gloomy. Typical kind of Glasgow. <laughs> but um, hopefully it picks up. We've been having some good weather recently Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. So um, we've got over 200 people here um, already watching. We've got some people commenting in the comments, which is great. We've got people from as far away as Aberdeen and India. Um, we've got a few people joining us from all the way down there in England as well. I think I saw someone, um, we've got someone from Leicestershire. Uh, very exciting, and someone as far away from me as Fort William. So um, fantastic uh, set of uh, insights, I think, if um, we've got such people in the comments. I'm gonna hand over to Nav and Melina. Um, please remember, um, I will be asking for comments and I will try and put them to Nav and Melina whenever appropriate, but I'm gonna be working in the background, hopefully making sure the slides come in at the right time. Um, if they aren't doing that, you can blame me. So um, I'm just going to hand over to you two. I'm going to take myself away. And when you want the first slide, just let me know. Thanks, Tom. All right, brilliant, thanks. Um, so, I mean, uh, maybe it's useful to just start off to say, Melina, um, that, you know, we're, we've kind of pitched this as a conversation. So um, we'll try and make it as accessible and as easygoing as I think we possibly can. Um, so I thought to kick off the conversation um, with us, uh, between us, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the myths around decolonization and decoloniality, right? So, um, Melina, I'm not sure how, uh, how much you might have heard or what your experiences are around this, but like the connotations around 
decoloniality and specifically this term of decolonizing the curriculum um, often gets a lot of resistance and backlash um, because of perhaps some of the connotations that they have. Um, do, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's a catchphrase that's very popular at the moment, decolonizing the curriculum, and that means it can often be just watered down and not really well understood at times. Um, and the sort of connotations people might have, it's like, oh, we need to burn all the books and start from scratch and we can't teach anything of the, like that we already teach. So um, I think it's worth definitely unpacking some of the the, the meanings behind decoloniality. Yeah, agreed, right? And and especially, you know, both of us speaking from our ties with the anti-racist educator collective, um, again, having maybe clarifying some of the differences between these terms and approaches is, is also necessary for, for as we move on in our chat today, um, when we start talking about, you know, the implications for classroom and practice. Mm -hmm. um, so like you said, one of the, one of the things, uh, one of the myths that I picked, that I thought about was that colonization has ended um, and that we actually need to move on. Um, and so this is, I think, an important point that colonization and coloniality and therefore decolonization and decoloniality are um, need to be differentiated, right? So um, mm -hmm. uh, if we look at like, uh, if we look at slide one, yeah. we can bring that up. Um, you know, we, we talk about coloniality as referring to long-standing patterns of power that emerged as a result of colonialism, but that define culture, labor, intersubjective relations, and knowledge production well beyond the strict limits of colonial administrations. So, I mean, this is, this is probably quite a dense way of saying, well, co colonization was uh, an event or series of events uh, that took place and, you know, we have access to the history of how that happened. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about, you know, history as being, uh, you know, having, uh, of us having different versions of how history has been recorded. So we have, you know, a dominant version of how uh, colonization happened. Coloniality then mm -hmm. is more like a logic. So if we move into slide two, we'll have, uh, get a sense of, how this works, right? So here we talk about how coloniality is maintained alive in books, in the criteria for academic performance, in cultural patterns, in common sense, uh, in the self-image of peoples, in aspirations of self and so many other aspects of our modern experience. In a way, as modern subjects, we breathe coloniality all the time and every day. So, I mean, this is quite a powerful statement and again, quite dense, but what it picks up on is the idea that coloniality is a logic. It is a, almost like a system of reason. And so like any other, uh, anything else that's been naturalized or made dominant, um, it is through the repetition of certain actions, certain ways of thinking, certain ways of, be, of doing and being um, over a long period of time that makes it just seem normal and common sense. Um, and so, when we start talking about colonization has ended, yes, you know, so even after desegregation and, um, you know, the, the liberation of colonized states, those moments have ended. And on one hand, it means we can relook at some of those moments, but on the other hand, it also means that there's a certain way of thinking that, mm -hmm. that still persists, that is, that draws on a, on a history of coloniality. Mm -hmm. um, the yeah, second thing is about, oh, sorry, do you want to? Sorry, yeah, it's important to remember how colonization actually happened. It wasn't just about dominating people. It was also about dominating their minds, colonizing their minds. And I think that's something that I find really useful when thinking about um, decolonizing. It's not just about um, a state getting independence. It's also about thinking the how the colonial power is still present in the way we think and in the in the books we read um, and how we breathe it. Um, I really love that quotation. So yeah. even thinking about why we speak English, I mean, I'm, I'm from an, I'm French and Indian. Um, the only reason I speak English is because my mother is Indian and she was taught English as her mother tongue in India. So 
um, we we literally live um, coloniality. Exactly, and so it is the system of dominance. Um, and I relate to that whole issue of language completely. You know, um, I often talk to my students who I can see have some of uh, whom have joined us today. Um, so hopefully they, they don't think I'm lying. Uh, but uh, uh, there's a few times where I've mentioned, you know, let's think about English as a language of power um, and how uh, myself as a, if we use myself as an example, as a South African Indian growing up in South Africa, um, my accent, my the the fact that I speak standard English, that I that I am a monolingual English speaker, um, says a lot about the history of colonial colonialism that took place in South Africa, but then of coloniality. You know, uh, the way I use language and the version of language that I have access to is the powerful dominant form. Um, and personally, that's also given me a lot of access to a range of things. But in other ways, you know, what parts of um, South African, Indian, or immigrant, or you know, other identities um, are, are kind of set aside as a result of that, um, and I think that's that's that becomes an important point uh, when we talk about you know how do we talk about English and use what does English education perhaps look like um, in that way? Um, do you want to add anything? to that or? No, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, we're, yeah, that we're disconnected to those um, pre-colonial roots in a way. So the fact that I can't speak Hindi, for example, or I'm trying to learn um, is a way of trying to decolonize my mind and sort of go back to those roots. But um, yeah, absolutely. And thinking what that means in, in the UK, in Scotland, um, how that those common assumptions um, that have been brought through through coloniality still exists in the in the classroom and in the text we teach. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so this uh, another myth that I that I kind of picked up on, and actually I've seen this on Twitter quite a bit, um, is that decoloniality and so even anti-racist education is ideological, uh, whereas current education is not. And I think this is an important myth to kind of unpack because yes, because in fact, I think that whole, that idea misunderstands what ideology is. Um, and, you know, this goes back to um, a quote that I found and it's, it's not on a slide, so I'll just read it out, but it's by Paulo Freire. Um, uh, I think it's from Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And Paulo Freire says, education is politic politicity, right? So it is political. Um, it is never neutral. When we try to be neutral, we support the dominant ideology. Not being neutral, education must either be liberating or domesticating. And so even our current, so whenever we think of education and teaching English as a neutral activity, it's, it's not, it isn't in fact neutral. In fact, it's still making um, decisions about including and excluding some, it's serving the interests and identities of some at the expense of others. Um, and so there there's still decisions about who, who makes it into a curriculum and so like whose version mm -hmm. of English do we teach, um, whose texts, whose stories, where do those stories come from. Um, and so decoloniality is ideological, but so is education as it stands now. Um, what it is, is, decoloniality is asking us to shift our value systems um, in interesting ways. Um, so, for example, coloniality tends to highly value sameness. Um, and so this is an, uh, the idea that, you know, uh, well, sameness, monoculturalism, monolingualism, um, mm -hmm. and so that focus on the one, you know, a canon or a standard variety of language means that we're only ever seeing um, a small fragment of the kind of knowledge or experience or cultures or identities that are actually available in the world. Decoloniality is premised then on plurality, 
this idea mm -hmm. that, well, mm -hmm. there are multiple ways of being and there are multiple ways of knowing and doing. Um, and therefore, education in itself should be an exploration of all these ways of doing things. Um, how do, maybe this maybe this goes back to Melina, what you said about um, the connotation of decoloniality mm -hmm. uh, being mm -hmm. about burning the books and starting again, you know, like getting rid of what yeah. we're already doing. Um, how does the yeah. emphasis how do you yeah. the emphasis on plurality actually nullifies that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we see that 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 myth of uh, being being political is a bad thing or ideological. So um, things like promoting Black History Month um, is, is often I mean it's not done much in Scotland and it's often uh, people are often afraid of it because it seems to be too political. Um, but actually, it's again the idea of staying with the status quo is just easy because you don't really see it. Um, but whenever you go, you try to move away from that, it's more visible and um, it's maybe focusing more on the, the sort of, um, differences that uh, challenge the status quo. And that's where people get uncomfortable. And there's a lot of um, it's challenging those again common sense assumptions that that come with coloniality. So um, I think it's really important to um, yeah th think about that. What it means to be political. Everything that we do is political. Comes with political decisions. Um, and this neutrality is actually not not really what we think it is. Um, education is not neutral. So yeah, I see it a lot in education. <laughs> Oh, yeah, exactly. And I think um, there's, there's a kind of safety in normativity, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we talk about decoloniality, so today I think uh, we'll probably, I'm just looking at the time, we'll probably need to move into like talking about practice a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, although I, I do find these discussions about the, the conceptual stuff quite delicious. Um, but, it, uh, but what decoloniality asks for is um, that we recognize how power works. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, while we, we'll, when we move on to the next part of our chat, um, we'll maybe, we will be focusing on uh, racism and anti-racism specifically. Mm -hmm. um, it's important to know that, you know, we navigate privilege and power mm -hmm. and marginality in, in very comple complex ways. Um, so taking on this kind of decolonial perspective recognizes that you know, um, so yes, you know, you might be marginalized in terms of race or culture and ethnicity, but even within that, you may experience pockets of privilege based on your gender or sexuality. Um, you know, so it is about making those things complicated um, and recognizing the complexities of those things as well. Um, and so, um, before, I guess one last thing before we kind of start talking about what we can start doing in the classroom and what this means for teaching English, um, I, I I did want to say that it's you know anti-racist education contributes I think quite significantly to a decolonial project, right? Because it starts to it starts giving us a vocabulary for recognizing for, for seeing and recognizing and then speaking back to issues of power related to race ethnicity culture um, even faith and tradition uh, or religion um, and i think that's the important part um, you know uh, there there's a lot of connections between decoloniality and like queer theory for example mm -hmm. um, you know relationships between gender and sexuality. Um, yeah, it's very much intersectional, isn't it? Because uh, again, with coloniality, you've got a certain way of thinking about gender as very binary, whereas in other cultures, actually, that wasn't the case. So you had a lot of um, hierarchies that were sort of implemented and um, just seeped into people's minds and cultures, which makes it really difficult to to rethink it, um, yeah, yeah, exactly, and um, and so let's maybe move on into this this discussion about race. So, Melina, from both the work that um, you've done as a founder of the Anti Racist Educator, 
and mm. as your role as an English teacher in Scotland, um, what are some of the things that, what is like the tangible things um, that can be done in order to explore and take up these kind of critical ways of, of, of approaching teaching English? Mm -hmm. So I think we have to start by questioning, I mean, there's so much to do, <laughs> questioning the texts we teach um, and how we teach them. Um, so I think if we, can we move on to the next slide, perhaps that might help us. Um, I wanted to talk about that, uh, the matrix of power. Yeah, so um, if we look at how colonial coloniality works, uh, so it's the matrix of power of knowledge um, and being. So colonial con coloniality of power refers to the interrelation among modern firms of exploitation and domination. Um, so when I look at racism, I don't just focus um, on the sort of, uh, ra ra well, the, the assumptions that racism is only what bad people do. Um, it's more about power. So how those relationships uh, work in the classroom, in the school could actually replicate some of the colonial um, power of domination. So the colonial forms of domination and exploitation. Um, so this is really important when we think about um, multicultural classrooms where there might be um, a person of color, a pupil of color, or even a teacher of color, how that teacher of color is treated by other staff or um, white members, that those relationships of power still actually re replicate some coloniality and actually um, institutional racism. So I think we'll explain that maybe a bit later. Um, and then when we think about coloniality of knowledge, that has to do with the impact of colonization on the different areas of knowledge production. Um, so that's where we need to think about the sort of text that we always teach. Why is it um, that a certain type of uh, text is always valued and seen as more important, um, more um, sophisticated in a way and worth teaching? Um, so very often we'll have I mean, the big, big authors like um, Paul Dickens or Shakespeare. Um, and I think in Scotland, there's been already an attempt to, to move away from that um, in English as in from England <laughs> authors uh, that, that it's trying to move towards Scottish text with um, written in Scots language. But we also need to think about um, the different uh, ways of representing uh, again, marginalized identities other than just uh, Scots identities. So looking at um, writers, authors of color, and the, the third matrix would be the coloniality of being. So how we make primary reference to the lived experience of colonization and its impact on language. So thinking about the language we use, again, why, why do we speak English? What sort of English is still valued as powerful? Um, what does it mean to, to be professional when you speak? Um, so even thinking about, again, common sense assumptions about uh, the way you dress or um, what is considered to be professional um, and eloquent. Um, so these these are the sort of things that replicate uh, coloniality. So I think that's been really helpful for me thinking about anti-racist education, how um, the relationships you form in the, cl in the classroom and in, in the staff room can replicate some of those um, colonial re relationships that there are, that can be racist. Um, so that might, yeah, I think, I will break down race, what we mean by racism in the next couple of slides, and that might make a bit more sense. Okay, nice. Yeah, and I think, you know, those three categories of coloniality are important, you know, so that coloniality of power is, you know, about who has power, what are the dominant understandings um, of education that, that persist, you know, and how are they replicated, like you said, in, in kind of even the everyday interactions. Um, and I think that's an important point is that, um, you know, when when the recent like Black Lives Matter protests started, um, there was there was perhaps quite a bit of talk about the various ways of supporting movements um, that seek to uproot these issues of power. 
and that it's everything from you know play, putting your body uh, in a vulnerable position by actively being out in the streets and protesting but it's also about these everyday interactions about uh, that um, involve how we value and talk to people and whose stories matter and like whose stories make it into a curriculum and the kinds of questions we ask about the stories that are already there um, and then knowledge, you know, where does that knowledge come from? Whose knowledge counts? And then being what kinds of identities matter and whose ways of being and doing are, are actually valued the most. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you know, that, that kind of underpins for, for what you've been saying. So, um, um, you know, uh, and, and there's something that you, that you mentioned that, I, the, that made me think of, you know, I did, did a presentation on um, kind of decoloniality in, in Scotland. And um, uh, there was, I think, a gasp when I, when I kind of spoke about Scotland as a potentially post-colonial or partly post-colonial context, you know, because it, it was both an instrument of um, colonization and coloniality, um, and but uh, in many ways, because of the, like you said, that emphasis on standard English mm -hmm. as uh, the dominant form, there, there's a, there have been some moves to include Scots language um, and Scottish literature into the curriculum. And those are significant moves, but like you said, there are, um, there, there are multiple ways that Scotland's becoming increasingly diverse. And so what it means to be Scottish, be in Scotland, speak, uh, speak in, in and across languages uh, in Scotland um, mm. and experience what it means to live and, and be here. It's starting to it also needs to be recognized. And there's a history of that that maybe doesn't always filter into the classroom. Um, We've yeah. got a question from Andrew Fry about that actually. Would you consider the lack of Scots being recognized as a language that's properly taught in schools rather than just the occasional class on Burns, an English class, part of coloniality of knowledge? So, uh, yeah, I think. Again, it, it is about those uh, th those hierarchies of power um, within language. So again, standard English um, is seen as the the mo well worth studying. But actually, in the Scottish curriculum with the Scottish set text, um, I've seen I, I've been um, I've seen that actually more more teachers are teaching um, Scots text. We've got um, Anne Donovan. We've got uh, Lots of lo yeah, lots of different options to teach Scots, um, and even for me, I mean, I, I don't speak Scots. It's it's quite challenging for me to read some of the texts out loud. But then I get pupils in the class to read them, um, to use the right uh, pronunciation, and that's a way of valuing uh, the diversity in the classroom and also the different identities that tend to be, um, I guess, marginalised. If you look at uh, Britain. But within that, we also need to think about um, the the relationships of power within um, Scotland. So, looking at Burns, he was. Uh, I mean, if if he didn't, if, if his writing didn't take off, he would actually have ended up um, in Jamaica, I think, as a plantation, working on a plantation, uh, managing slaves. So we need to think about that history as well. Not thinking of Scotland just as um, a victim in a way because there was a lot of complicity in that uh, process of colonization um, and exploitation of lands. So that is something that we also need to consider when um, we are trying to uh, increase diversity in multiple narratives um, in the teaching of English texts and um, history as well. So, yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And, you know, so there's a there's a difference between, you know, dealing with some of the cultural issues and also the material issues. You know, so mm -hmm. these issues of value um, have very real material effects on the learners that we're, we're working with and, the, and you know, t marginalized teachers. Um, and so while there's been an active kind of inclusion of Scots language, for example, 
Um, and, you know, some of that can be problematized because, you know, Scots language is still part of an English curriculum, whereas, you know, it, it still recognizes a language on its own. But it also raises issues about, you know, whose languages and ways of speaking are not making it into the classroom. Um, and how do we use that in culturally responsive or sustainable ways? Um, so, for example, I know there's a project um, by Belinda Mendelovitz um, at Wits University where uh, student teachers have to draw on their multilingual practices. So the assumption is that all students are multilingual and that they um, uh, and that they're they start writing. So it's a creative writing course, uh, but they start writing from their youth varieties. Um, and they construct these very complex dialogues, um, but mixing languages and uh, working across it, and then setting those stories in recognizable contexts. You know, so sometimes um, it's a, it's like in a little tavern or a bar or a pub. Uh, sometimes it's you know on the side of the street and it's two friends talking. And they're talking about issues that matter to them in ways that matter to them. Um, they then revisit those stories um, and start analyzing, well, what's happening, you know, how, uh, when you constructed the stories, what decisions did you make about how to tell that story? You know, yeah. why did you use language in this way? Or, um, and, and so they also problematize their own kind of stories or the dialogues um, asking questions about, well, is this the best way to represent someone? Or, you know, are you just reproducing another stereotype about, um, say, black youth uh, mm -hmm. and talking, or especially black male youth talking about women? Or mm -hmm. are, you may, are you representing people and yourself, so representing yourself and others in fair and kind of equitable ways? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a useful, useful kind of strategy of starting with the way learners speak as a way to get access to standard varieties of English. Um, sorry. That's a really good way of um, just creating multiple narratives and really valuing the different, um, the, the diversity in your classroom. So depending on where pupils uh, in your classroom come from, focusing on what they actually know. And um, in the English curriculum in secondary school, you've got reflective writing, creative writing, where you can really give them an opportunity to explore their identities and parts of their identities that might not be valued. Um, but also with creative writing, gives you a chance to explore ways of um, creating empathy for um, m marginalized people that um, some of the pupils in your classroom might not usually be able to um, empathize with because of the lack of narratives that that um, humanize them. And perhaps that's a good way, this is a good time to look at the next slide, this idea of decoloniality as a humanizing force. Um, so I guess I can read it out. Um, if coloniality refers to logic, metaphysics, ontology, and a matrix of power, that can continue existing after formal independence and desegregation. Decoloniality refers to efforts at rehumanizing the world, to breaking hierarchies of difference that dehumanize subjects and communities and that destroy nature, and to the production of counter discourses, counter knowledges, counter creative acts, and counter practices that seek to dismantle coloniality and to open up multiple form other um, multiple other forms of being in the world and i think that the idea of humanizing narratives is so important um because when you get people to do some creative writing or you find text that you think oh there's there's uh, a representation of a black person so this this is going to be a good text actually you need to think about the representation um, that is in that text so is the representation humanizing does that person of color the black person in the book actually have agency um, do they have a voice or are they being portrayed um, through the white gaze um, so is it through a white person's perception that can actually dehumanize do they have um, the do they have an agency over their um, their story? Do they have a voice? Is it written by a person of color? 
um, we should really be thinking about that. So very often people um, might look at, for example, To Kill a Mockingbird as an anti-racist text, um, but actually is written by a white person and is narrated by white people. Um, and there is there's no real sense of uh, black, black people's agency. So um, black people are always seen by a white person and they're, um, they're contextualized by a white person and they're hardly ever given a voice. And that really makes it easy um, to, to dehumanize them, or, but also portray them as victims that need to be saved. Um, so thinking about the power dynamics within a story, whether it's through creative writing of a pupil or a text that you're teaching, um, we all ne always need to be critical of um, the sort of the savior narratives, for example, um, and how those can be questioned. Doesn't mean you don't have to teach the text, but um, they need to be critically questioned and perhaps repaired. So if there's uh, that agency that's missing, or that story, that voice that's missing, get your pupils to imagine that voice through creative writing um, to recreate that that agency. Um, so, for example, when I taught a bit of Ian Crichton Smith, one of the um, Scottish set texts, um, is the the short story is called Home, and that basically looks at uh, a white Scottish man who lived in South Africa. He comes back to Glasgow. Um, and he makes some comments about uh, black people in South Africa, and it's very dehumanizing. The, the reader is supposed to see that he's got racist assumptions about black people, but there's no actual voice of a black person in that story. Um, and it can be really uncomfortable as well for pupils, um, especially black pupils, if you have any in your classroom, to face those stories where you, you see black people being dehumanized and nothing really being done about it. Um, so it's important to think about uh, counter representations, counter narratives that can challenge those racist assumptions and actually help pupils empathize, but also uh, think more critically about the stories that they read. Hmm. I think that's that's exactly right. So, you know, the, the, the use of the word counter is mm -hmm. kind of uh, is a really important one here because um, and this makes me think of like in critical literacy, we talk about rubbing texts up together. You know, it's necessary to always kind of pair texts together. So if you've got a story like To Kill a Mockingbird, for instance, which is, um, you know, sort of told from the perspective of a, um, of a white character, then are you pairing that up with texts that are, that reveal the positions or experiences um, of black and um, and other ethnic uh, or people of color kind of perspectives, um, and and that's that's important. You know, uh, it it kind of makes me it also makes me think of um, the movement of post coloniality. So Ngugi Wa Tiongo, for example, um, or Chinua Achebe, um, and um, and things fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was the. The, that was not rewriting history, you know, there's a, to, to a certain extent those those events happened, but how we record them and whose version, whose memory of those events uh, we get to look at uh, mm -hmm. and get to consider very like seriously is is really important. Um, so um, we've got so a question. Uh, English with Mrs. Grant, is it problematic to ask white people to attempt to represent or give a voice to an identity um, they haven't lived or experienced? So I, I think that's a really, really good question um, because it's true, it, it's it's so easy to fall into that, that trap in a way of um, trying to represent an identity that, that you don't authentically know. Um, and I think, Navin, you were giving good examples of uh, getting pupils to think more critically about their creative writing and asking themselves whether through their writing they are reproducing some of those racial stereotypes or uh, gender stereotypes and whether those representations are fair. Um, so I think there, there's um, scope for letting them explore through their writing, but it's true that I think we need to be very careful about that. Um, making sure that pupils are given the tools to consider 
the the issues that might arise in their writing um, and getting them to think more critically about their own positionality. I really recognizing that okay, as a writer, I might be I don't know a, a boy, um, a white boy. What does that mean if I'm trying to replicate um, the voice of the of a woman of color? How can I access um, the sort of experiences without making it tokenistic um, or ingenuine? Finding actual texts that are written by women of color to make uh, make those those stories more um, realistic and authentic. Um, so modeling and scaffolding those um, those experiences through writing is is really important, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I think that's that's a that's a really interesting point because and a really interesting question actually because um, uh, you know, on one hand, it's about recognizing the limits of our perspectives, you know, um, so the, because we as humans are positioned, you know, we take up certain identities, whether it's relation to race, gender, sexuality, uh, culture, religion, and so seeing things beyond that, sometimes we can empathize and we can uh, we can try to see things from other people's perspectives, but that's very difficult. And like you said, it's very easy to slip into tropes and reproducing problematic stereotypes and, mm -hmm. and um, doing it tokenistically. Mm -hmm. So um, a colleague from UKLA, uh, Ross Young and I are actually working on a document kind of talking about how do you give, how do you enable learners to um, to represent identities that they don't have, or how do you represent um, learners or and identities that are not always present in the class? So if you've got a homogenous, you know, uh, white classroom, how do you how, how do you represent and bring in black and POC voices and perspectives even in writing? Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things we said is developing a culture of sharing and in kind of criti giving critical feedback. So it's important for learners to have opportunities to, when they write, to share what they've written and do it the same kind of analysis that you would do of a literary text, asking questions about, well, is this fair? Is this character in the background or in the, um, in the foreground? Are they being uh, valued? Are they just there tokenistically? being able to interrogate each other's texts in that mm -hmm. way, and creating yeah. a culture where we're happy to share and almost help each other identify when we're slipping into those tropes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's necessary because they will always be slippage, you know, of when you have to unlearn what you always thought you knew or what, when you see things from your own perspective and you become quite secure in that, it's really difficult to have to learn a whole new way of speaking. Um, mm -hmm. and so it's necessary to, to work with some of that slippage. People will say something offensive or slip and reproduce a stereotype or something discriminatory sometimes, but we have to tackle it. We can't just ignore it. Um, yeah. I see we've got another. Uh, yeah, uh, we had a comment earlier as well about um, black peoples and peoples of color having to do it all the time, try and imagine different identities. Um, I think we could maybe talk about that in a second. And um, that, yeah, that just reminded me as well that actually for a lot of white teachers, um, there needs to be that that critical questioning when, when they're teaching, when they're trying to um, engage in creative writing with different identities that they might not relate to um, and actually that that position of humility trying to position yourself as uh, as a learner amongst others in the classroom um, helps you overcome those barriers of thinking that actually I can't get it wrong because I'm a teacher um, really engaging that growth mindset positioning yourself as someone um, who well, they be oh, genuine about your identity as so even saying as a white white man or white woman, um, I I I need to question the way I represent people of color, and it's something that I'm learning. Maybe you can, uh, we can do this together, learn together, and value the the sort of perspectives that already are in the classroom. If you do have peoples of color, um, but I think yeah, there are definitely some things we need to consider um, when you shouldn't always be. Um, drawing on pupils of color to try and correct you either. Um, 
maybe this is a good place to move on to the next slide. I, I'm conscious of time. <laughs> um, so for example, uh, thinking about the impact that uh, this decolonial, well, coloniality has on pupils, um, pupils of color especially. Um, so there's research from 2004, Scottish research, looking at the, uh, the experiences of minor, visible minority ethnic pupils in Scotland. And um, this is a quotation from a black pupil who said, uh, the teacher said, third world, including Africa, everyone was just like slowly looking straight at me. And I just felt kind of awkward because I didn't know what was going on. So you got this sense of discomfort. It's really uncomfortable being a black people whenever um, somebody's going, well, the teacher's going to talk about Africa or slavery. Um, the pupil then goes on. And then I realized what she had said. She was making a poster and had the devil and an angel. And she had this white girl with fruit and a black family from Africa. So people think of it as hell. So you can see that this would have made the black people really uncomfortable. Um, this might have even be quite traumatic. It might cause a bit of racial trauma, um, especially if you're the only black people in a classroom and everyone else is white, everyone is staring at you. Um, it's, it's important to consider the impact of these narratives, these representations. Um, actually have they, they have a really strong impact on the mental health of peoples of color um, so if we move on to the next next part of the slide sorry um, we've got uh, yeah so a quotation from a parent so this would be a parent of a pupil of color um, she says one of my daughters was saying she wishes she was white that is hurting disappointing for me because I don't want her to be like that. I want her to be proud of her color, proud of her culture. The school played a big role in that. Um, so we really need to think about the impact of all these narratives. Um, it, coloniality of power um, is present in the classroom, it's present in the school, it's present in the media we watch. Um, so basically it's all these implicit messages that we get in society that tell us that if you're not um, a certain way, you're less than everyone else. Um, so here it's very clear that it's it's about skin color. Um, and unfortunately, this is something that still happens in Scotland. We've got um, young children who try to whiten their skin because they don't like the color of their skin. And that has a lot to do with um, the messages that they're getting both from school, but from the society they live in um, and that we, we still live in. So um, this has, again, as I said, a huge, impact on their mental health. It's a problem with body image. Um, in worst case scenarios, it can actually lead to self-harm. It's something that's still not really researched enough, um, the impact of racial trauma. Um, and if we click onto the next part of the slide, um, just drawing on the work of a black psychologist, uh, Franz Fanon, who wrote Black Skin, White Masks. He explains that actually being a black person in a white space is hugely psychologically taxing. Um, and so as a teacher, you really need to question um, how you can help your pupils, pupils of color, if you teach any pupils of color, um, navigate the space in the class and in, in the school in a safe way, in a way that makes them feel comfortable. So if you are going to teach a text with a racial stereotype that's not really questioned, or a text that might um, make every all, all the pupil stare at this one pupil, um, it's important to engage in conversations with that pupil beforehand and make sure that uh, you are doing everything you can to make them feel most comfortable. I think especially uh, as a teacher of color, whenever we talk about race, I tend to focus on making white peoples comfortable because I don't want them to be um, uh, uncomfortable, but actually I realized that I need to focus also on the pupils of color, making sure that throughout the, the, the lessons, everything I do does prioritize their comfort because it's really uncomfortable being a person of color in a white society. And that's something you have to do with every day. And that that just is magnified when you're in your classroom and um, you've got representations that again are racially problematic. So um, I don't know if you have anything to say about that before. We yeah, well, 
Uh, yeah, and I want to maybe just add to that because I think those are like hugely important important points. Is you know, so as teachers, the decisions we make have a social impact on the learners' um, experience, and but also their understandings of what counts as knowledge, and you know, what kinds of knowledge count. Um, and so uh, I think there are, um, th I think there are, there are potentially are two main areas or options to consider. One is that we are asking the critical questions about the kinds of texts that we teach um, and that we're making careful decisions about what kinds of texts we include. And so even if we have to teach a particular, say, prescribed or set text, that we're pairing that up with um, the texts that represent alternative perspectives and uh, um, and experiences. So on one hand, it's actively being critical about the text that we're, and stories and interactions that we're, we're using in the classroom. The other thing, and, and I think this is also, you know, kind of in the long term helps to set up, I want to say almost like a new normal, but it's using diverse texts to normalize diversity and difference, you know, so, uh, I'm thinking of, you know, so sometimes when we when we deal with the text that's written by um, an author, uh, a, a, a black author or, or an author of color, um, sometimes the story that they're telling positions their own racial identity kind of in the background mm -hmm. and talks about an experience, you know, so in other words, there's a, there's a humanizing effect where the, the storyteller although they're black or a person of color, they're, they're not only that, they're, they're all kinds of other things as well. And so um, we want to sometimes deal with, to in, include texts and include these identities in ways that normalize, mm -hmm. um, normalize them as present and, and as valuable. Um, and, and so I would add, don't, don't wait for uh, peoples of color to be in your classroom, start doing it even when you've got only white pupils in your classroom, because I know in Scotland, lots of teachers will only have uh, white pupils in their classroom. So it doesn't mean that diverse representations aren't important because that's it's about normalizing, as you say, um, the different racial identities and different identities that tend to be marginalized. Yeah, exactly. So you know, if I think about it in the uh, with the student teachers that I work with, there are there's a session where you know the issue of race maybe came up more explicitly because it was very evident in the text and we were analyzing the text but in another session um and it was during lockdown so it was more of a webinar but we would but we it, it was a webinar on um designing units of work and so the text that i use as an used as as an example um was written by ken temba who is a black South African and it was written during apartheid. So while the issues of race were there and they kind of came up, they were, they were, they were almost sidelined. And I mean, this is where it becomes quite slippery because it's not that the race uh, and the issues of apartheid didn't matter. Yeah. What it meant was that the fact that we were dealing with a story where all the characters were black South Africans, um, yeah was just taken as the taken as the uh, as taken for granted um mm -hmm. and that it was the story that they were telling um that mattered and we we used it as a text so again navigating and trying to balance off being very critical but also normalizing the fact that there are multiple stories and that all there are different kinds of people that make up the world yeah. and including yeah. those as part of your normal practice Mm -hmm. um, is, 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 I think, quite useful. Absolutely. Um, can we move on to the next slide, perhaps? So, yeah, so thinking about uh, racism, whenever somebody thinks of racism or what it means to be anti-racist, I think we need to start off with definitions to really uh, clarify that. So we've clarified what decolon uh, decoloniality means. Um, but when we think about racism i think most people will focus on the interpersonal aspect of racism um, looking at prejudices and discriminatory behaviors where one group makes assumptions about the abilities motives and intents of 
another group based on their race. Um, so very often people might think of texts as being racist um, based on the sort of uh, uh, representations that exist within that text. And I think that that is quite limiting because we need to look at uh, the broader picture and the broader, well, the, the different ways that racism works. It's not just about um, racist hate crime or racist discrimination. Um, so I think if we, to be effective in our anti-racism, we also need to consider um, interna internalized racism. So when members of stigmatized groups are bombarded with negative messages about their own abilities and intrinsic worth, they may internalize those negative messages. So that's um, the example we looked at earlier with a, uh, a black people wishing that their skin was white because all the messages they've been getting from the text they read, from the messages they see in, in media and society, um, tell, tell them that actually um, black skin is not valuable, it's not uh, a, a symbol of worth. So we really need to be careful um, when looking at internalized racism and also the impact it has on white pupils. Um, it's very easy to start um, internalizing superiority whenever you see uh, a different skin tone. Um, so it's applicable to white pupils as well. We also need to look at institutional racism. So the collective failure of an organization to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their color, culture, or ethnic origin. Um, so we need to think about the curriculum. Are we um, providing a, a, an appropriate service for the different pupils in, in the school? Or is it just valuing or prioritizing the needs of white learners, white pupils? And finally, cultural racism, which I think is very, yeah, very closely linked to um, coloniality um, of knowledge. So it's holding white Western culture as normative and the undervaluing of any non-white and non-Western cultural norms, beliefs, and lifestyles. Um, so when we do anti-racist work, it's really important to start from a, a, a a critical understanding of racism to then unpack that and um, to, to counter the racism that already exists. So starting from a place that, that places racism is actually quite common in society, not something that's abnormal and unusual, um, really helps you think more critically about your classroom practice and what you can do to make sure that your practice is anti-racist. Um, can we move on maybe to the next slide and then um, do, it. Oh, do you want me to talk about this really quickly? Um, <laughs> yeah, we're running we've got about sure. two minutes, and um, and hopefully we get to the slides where we where we've got books and like texts um, that uh, that we suggest. So this is a critical literacy framework by Hilary Jenks, um, and it's an understanding of power. Um, so uh, so it is it's called the interdependent model where. Um, where in order to do critical literacy, we must always be considering and asking questions related to issues of access, domination or power, uh, diversity or identity, um, and design or redesign. So um, I think for literacy and language, uh, English literacy and language teachers, this is a particularly useful framework for thinking about, well, who, you know, how do texts work? How does power become instantiated in texts? Um, what access do we have and to whose identities do we have access to? Um, and so, and, and how is that embedded in the way genres are, are comprised or constructed, how stories are told, uh, the kinds of decisions that different authors make um, and therefore also putting your learners in the position of text designers. You know, what kinds of decisions do they make when they're writing a story, constructing a poem, putting a poster together? Are, are they aware of the potential social impact of the kinds of decisions that they make? And so if this becomes, if this kind of heightened awareness of how language is used as a tool to either you know, give power or take power or remove power or share power, uh, that becomes um, an important way of thinking about it. So I won't go into any more detail than that, but uh, that <laughs> is, is really useful, I think. 
Thank you. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, so just a couple of uh, frequently asked questions when we're uh, looking at anti-racism and decolonizing the curriculum. Um, my teachers who feel that they're not racist and that means their teaching can't be racist. Again, we need to question what we mean by racism because we live in a society that is that has inherited a system of racism. Um, remember that colonization um, create, well, created racism. Racism was created uh, over several centuries and it's not something that we can dismantle overnight. So starting off by accepting that um, it's very, very probable that we live in a racist society, that everything um, we do can contribute to racism if we're not careful. So uh, doing nothing is probably going to contribute to racism unless you're actively anti-racist. Um, so starting off from a point that uh, every, everything we do if we're not um, actively anti-racist is probably contributing to racism is a good starting point. Um, looking at decolonizing the curriculum, does it mean that uh, we have to stop teaching Shakespeare and Dickens because um, they're old white men. No, that doesn't. I mean, we've already kind of discussed that. It's about thinking uh, about the the different perspectives you present in your curriculum and thinking more critically about the text. Um, so in Shakespeare, you'll often have um, representations of uh, darkness as evil or the word fair as um, a compliment is something that's um, worth looking up to. So. Uh, getting people to critically question the language that's used and the representations, but also putting those texts alongside other diverse um, and well writers of author uh, of, of color writers and authors of color to make sure that there is a balance and that those narratives um, are present and not marginalized. So it's about again countering the, those narratives. Um, that are problematic. Do, I don't have time to decolonize a curriculum and all the school books are pale, male and stale. So I think that is uh, a really good point. It's difficult to change everything um, over one summer. It's important to think the different ways you can uh, present uh, multiple counter narratives. So if, if you're looking at text and you don't have any school resources new, for new books, for example, um, looking at poetry is a good place to start. And we've got a series of texts um, on the next slide to help you with that. Um, looking at uh, the well, creative writing, reflective writing. When you're looking at close reading as well with comprehension text, you can take extracts from um, different writers of color that uh, look at different issues that might not be in, in the rest of your curriculum. Um, so there's always space for, for imagination and um, questioning those, those uh, texts that you already teach. Um, I teach many pupils of color and they've never once complained to me. Um, I think it's important to really question um, whether not saying anything means that everything's okay. Um, so if, if you're teaching a text and it makes the people uncomfortable, they might not be, feel comfortable enough to talk about it. Um, so trying to create those safe spaces where pupils can come up to you and um, creating those conversations that can be uncomfortable um, to for pupils to raise issues um, and then trying to come with up with solutions that involve them where they um, their their voice is really valued is so important um, other things might be like other questions or common uh, assumptions might be race is not real so stop talking about it in the classroom um, race is not biologically real but it's a real social construct that has real impacts on people um, so it is important to have those conversations in the classroom and I think in some of the comments we saw that people aren't comfortable talking about racism and that is true we need to get used to having those uncomfortable discussions um, it takes a lot of practice a lot of um, time and effort, you will make mistakes. But again, if you place yourself as a learner in the classroom um, with humility, who's willing to learn and who is willing to question their practice and involve the pupils in the classroom to create a more inclusive space, then that's that's how we're going to move forward. Um, and maybe a final point is of mice and men, a racist text. Again, we need to think about what we understand by racism just because um, there is, uh, it was a text written by a white man and there's a 
in a way, negative representation of a black man with uh, the use of the N-word. We also need to think about um, how racism works um, and the different forms of racism. So as a text, it um, it's, gives a, a voice to a, a black man of, um, during the Jim Crow laws in the US, but we also need to think about how we teach the text. So reading out loud, um, using the N-word, it would not be appropriate, especially if you're not a black teacher. Um, and it is a, a real violent act saying the N-word in class, even if it's written in the text, because we still live in a society in a classroom where those power dynamics exist. Um, so it's really important to question how we teach the um, text with racial slurs, how we what we can do to make any pupils of color in the classroom feel most comfortable. Um, and again, thinking about why we tend to teach texts like To Kill a Mockingbird or Of Mice and Men that focus on racism in the US rather than the UK. Um, I think it's it's very common that all the texts that are about racism or racialized experiences um, that are most often taught in Scottish classrooms tend to be focused on American racism. And it's easier to comment on and criticize the racism that takes place in the US, um, but it's more uncomfortable looking at it when it happens in Scotland and in the UK. So um, finding texts that explore that might be worth um, your time as well. And uh, I think, yeah, we've covered most of those other points. Um, maybe the last slides. Uh, at slide 10. So looking with at, the example of books. Yeah, the example of books, yeah. Um, so Navin, do you wanna say anything? Yeah, well, so a lot of these books are, well, what I what I would think are useful for um, secondary high school teachers, you know. So um, especially in the BGE, I mean, some of the books are quite complex. So you might leave that for for slightly older learners. Mm -hmm. But um, there's uh, this is just like a really small selection of um, of books that uh, some of which speak directly to a UK uh, or a Scottish experience. Um, but also some that kind of that uh, speak across different um, cultural, ethnic, and racial identities. Um, that just again having these texts in the classroom um, right. mm -hmm. or having access to these texts or flagging them up. Um, so even if they're not studying it, you know, our learners do, do learners know about these books? Are you encouraging them to read it, read them for pleasure? Again, um, you know, a curriculum doesn't just sit, it's not just, it's not only the formal things that happen in a classroom, it happens outside. Mm -hmm. And so it is about that kind of educational culture and experience that you as teachers kind of construct. Uh, and how do, how much, on one hand, it's how much access do you provide learners, but how much do learners bring into the classroom? So are they popular culture or other texts that they're able to bring into classroom spaces and add to discussions. Um, and those, I think, can be significantly important links uh, for building that culture of sharing and humility and, um, again, um, including or built on plural plurality, uh, built on working across various identities and issues. Uh, yeah. And next, the next slide. Slide eleven. Um, um, and so these are texts for teachers specifically. So a lot of them are um, useful for uh, developing uh, one a vocabulary uh, for talking about power, uh, racism, and anti-racism. Um, it's they're also useful. Um, in developing uh, and building a lens through which to see the texts and education more broadly. Uh, so this, and, and this is an important point because um, like critical race theory, anti-racism, decoloniality, critical literacy, these are not just kind of sets of strategies, they are orientations mm -hmm. to teaching and learning. So in other words, they, they are a worldview or a perspective um, that, that a teacher takes up. Um, and so 
initially it's quite tricky because uh, you're learning new habits of ways to ask questions, ways to read texts. Um, you're trying to train yourself to notice things that you perhaps may not have noticed before. Um, you're you're building on the issues that are that that you do see uh, to access other issues that you perhaps have been missing because uh, because of your own position. Um, and so it is about long term kind of building and learning and unlearning what again what we think we we know um, and being comfortable with some of that uncertainty that it is a constant process of figuring things out um, and I think that's um, these books all kind of contribute to that mm -hmm. um, yeah Absolutely. Um, and I think, yeah, just maybe moving on to the next slide, um, you will find more resources, more reading lists on the antiracisteducator.com. So um, we created this online learning platform run by uh, educators of colour based in um, Scotland. Basically, the aim of the platform is to create a safe space for educators of colour to express themselves, um, but also well, to share our counter narratives that tend to be forgotten, tend to be marginalised. But also we wanted to be a place where um, educators of all racial identities, all um, different well, geographical regions um, for people to learn and gain access um, to these new lenses, to these new frameworks that help you develop your understanding of anti-racism and decolonization um, in different ways. So we've got a blog, we've got a few school resources, a glossary of key anti-racist terminology, um, listening, reading lists, and a podcast. Um, you can support us and follow us on Twitter. Um, we've got a Facebook page, and um, we are a voluntary organization with just teachers, educators. Um, this is our kind of hobby. So if you want to support our work um, for future projects, you can support us on Patreon and um, on PayPal on the antiracisteducator.com slash donate. Um, so we've got a blog post as well um, that Navin wrote about critical literacies. I personally found it so um, valuable in uh, rethinking the way I teach in the classroom, looking at, relooking at texts, um, and how we can question social issues um, of power um, and how we can disrupt those issues of power and transform them. Um, so really worth a, a read. And I don't know if we have time for questions. <laughs> we run over. I mean, so <laughs> I I'm so much as they dribbled in, but yeah. Yeah, there's quite there's some quite good ones as well. But I just want to say thank yeah. you so much, you two, for sharing your insight and obviously not just your, your your reading and obviously your practice in schools, but your own personal insights as well into into what it's like to be a, a, a teacher in the classroom, but also you know growing up in classrooms and, and your own background. Um, it was really really good, and there was a lot of engagement from the uh, from people on Twitter and people on in the comments. That's absolutely fantastic. I'm going to use this opportunity to say um, you know please subscribe to the SAIT website at the SAIT. Uh, YouTube feed and follow us on Twitter as well. Um, but uh, we we don't take any money for these events or anything like this. We're also a voluntary organisation. Um, but for this session, I really I really really recommend that people donate money to the Anti Racist Educators um, site because um, it's a great uh, place to get resources and and doing sterling work um, in uh, in supporting teachers across um, uh, across Scotland um, who are interested in these issues. Um, People are saying thank you in the comments, so it's fantastic. And um, we will go on for sort of a few minutes now with a few questions, but I think we'll have to wrap up at, by about 10 to or 5 to. Um, I don't want to cut it short for no reason when there's still interesting things to talk about. Um, I would say there's there's been a few comments that I thought I'd like to... Now everyone's saying thank you, I can't find them, which is a, a bit of a shame. Um, I think this is maybe an interesting one for people at the moment. So um, Shreya um, has asked, how do you encourage literature on the current topic of the killing of George Floyd. So I guess one of the reasons maybe some people um, are sort of tuning into the idea of decolonization and anti-racism has been the kind of roads must fall kind of statue and, and public spaces protests, but then also maybe in a British context, but also especially in the American context, the, the, the recent, recent resurgence of Black Lives Matter um, as a result of the, the murder of George Floyd by um, police officers in Minneapolis. Um, how would you say, how would you advise teachers who maybe even their pupils are talking about these things in the news and want to talk about them? How would you encourage people to 
you know, when an event like this happens, as it will continue to happen, um, what would you advise teachers to do when they're, when they're, they're wanting to talk about that? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I actually created um, some English resources looking at Black Lives Matter um, because I wanted to just engage my pupils and I knew that a lot of them wanted to learn more about the Black Lives Matter movement, um, but also thinking about what it has to do with the English curriculum, because very often uh, people will just think that, well, Black Lives Matter, that's more of a modern studies subject, um, it's not relevant to English. Um, so I encourage pupils to, first of all, learn more about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, or try and understand what happened in the US, but also link it to what's going on in the UK. Um, and I think this is where teachers probably need to do a bit of learning um, because the stories tend to be marginalised. So in Scotland, we've got um, the, the ongoing campaign for justice for Sheikh Kubayo, who was a black man um, who was died at of police brutality uh, in Fife in 2015 and his family still has not received any justice. Um, there's going to be another public inquiry into the issue. Um, but so learning that actually these issues of police brutality against black people in particular are not just an American concept, but they happen in Scotland as well. And institutional racism is a problem, um, I would say in, in every Western society. Um, so taking a look at where, where you live, um, trying to link uh, these American issues to local issues to find the connection, um, but then also exploring specifically anti-blackness and what anti-blackness means um, and how text uh, and the English curriculum contributes to anti-blackness. Um, so thinking about the, the different authors that we continue to teach, how many of them have uh, published texts that are explicitly anti-black um, with lots of racial stereotypes, um, lots of their texts that are now on the, pretty much censored because they're, they're too explicitly racist. And also questioning um, the, how anti-blackness is present in our, in our language, um, the different connotations that are associated to fairness, whiteness, um, and then blackness is evil and dark, um, but also encouraging pupils to um, accept that this is the sort of culture and language that we've inherited. It doesn't mean that we're bad people if we um, maybe have some of those implicit um, biases uh, against blackness because we learn them from the stories we read, the, the messages we see in society, um, but that actually starting to question and have those conversations, those crucial conversations about anti-blackness is something um, that, that will both empower pupils, but also make your, your classroom a safer space for future conversations to happen. Mm. And I think that's, uh, you know, like if you're if you're thinking about how how some of those issues kind of feed into the classroom, some of it is also about, you know, starting to think about teaching English as more than just teaching literature. Again, literature is, is a particular set of genres um, of language use. Um, and so, you know, if, if you're something, you know, the incident of um, George Floyd and even just the continuing kind of uh, resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, we can make connections between literature. So like Mallory Blackman's Noughts and Crosses, um, but even in that novel, uh, Mallory, Mallory Blackman includes like a whole lot of media texts, um, you know, that's, that's, situated, that's kind of in this fictional world. Um, so pairing literature with news, news stories and news reports, uh, with um, online videos and discussions, um, just allows us to access some of those ideas and social issues through multiple forms and media. Um, it also just means that, you know, learners can, yes, write to create a story that maybe uh, speaks back to those issues, but maybe they should, maybe they could explore or do an analysis of some of the media reports and video themselves in a conversation like this, you know, construct a podcast or a webinar um, for themselves based on like a very focused topic related to um, the story that they're studying, the social issue of, of blackness and anti-blackness or racism, um, and maybe even have like a response to Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, building it into the curriculum like that 
is is, is potentially really useful. That's, that's really really good point. Um, I think this might have to be the last question, unfortunately. Yeah. Sorry, there's a bit of echoing going on here. Um, and this is maybe one that I, I come up with as as a as a um, a British white teacher in a classroom. Um, you know, making these judgments seems like quite a lot of work. And I think this almost refers back to the kind of, I think you were talking about the cognitive load and the, the work that um, students of, of colour and, um, and BAME students have to do in a classroom um, when they're dealing with an entirely white environment. I think sometimes we as teachers get a little bit of an insight into that um, experience potentially when we're trying to consider things from the perspective of a, a black people in the class um, or non-white people in the class um, you know how can um, teachers white teachers in Scotland um, judge these texts do we have to do and I expect we do have to go and do that reading and that learning and that understanding uh, and do some work I don't know if there's a, sh a quick solution to this but maybe you have some ideas you know how can um, a white teacher um, judge whether a text is appropriate in a classroom, I guess. I think, again, it comes back to the idea of positioning yourself as a learner alongside um, the other learners in your classroom, um, because I think very often there's that, that fear of making mistakes, of offending people. Um, so it's really important to accept, well, take accountability. So if you do make a mistake and your your decision of text is uh, inaccurate and it does cause harm to some pupils of color if, if they complain for example then it's important to move away from your um maybe your um sorry <laughs> lost my train of thought uh move yeah move away from the that defensiveness that might arise um focusing less on your intentions even though you might have tried to make the correct decision um, and it did offend someone, it's important to be accountable for the impact. So genuinely apologize and try and in, um, it involve the learner in creating solutions um, and making their voice heard. Um, to prevent those mistakes from happening, it's also important to, again, engage in that growth mindset, except that there is a lot of learning and unlearning to do. Um, it's okay to mistakes as, make mistakes as long as you apologize. Um, but also don't, um, well, engage in conversations, ask your colleagues what, what they, they, they would do, um, what they think, make these conversations um, more normative, make it uh, a, a new culture in your school of questioning, of having these critical conversations, um, but also be wary of always relying on maybe the only teacher of color to answer all your questions, because that is an additional emotional uh, burden for them and also for pupils of color. Um, so it's important to find that balance of um, not always getting the, the person of color to do all the work for you. Mm. And I would say mm. yeah, the anti-racist educator is a great learning platform. So yeah. check it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one like really quick comment, because I know we're, we're running out of time. Um, but for me, it was, you know, a lot of my previous work was in gender and sexuality and um, and its connections with issues of race and language and you know all these other identity categories and what stood out for me was um that all oppression is connected you know so under you know, using because we all occupy positions of privilege and marginalization in different ways at different times using your 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 experiences of power so learning to recognize your own experiences of power and using that as a way of getting into understanding alternative experiences of power that is uh, is vital um you know so for myself who identifies as a cis male uh, person you know and, and there's a lot of learning that i need to do in terms of like say trans identities um um myself as a, a and a South Asian person, there's a lot of learning I need to do in terms of uh, black identities and anti-blackness and, and African identities. But there, there are way there are issues around how power works that I can relate to that will hopefully give me some access and some empathy, and then also just, just means that. I will also recognize, the, well, hopefully, the limitations of my identities. So as a cisgender male, there are some experiences of transgenderism that I will not have full access to, but I can empathize and, and listen. 
I mean, that's, I think that's a really important insight as well. And and especially if I'm just very, very aware that, you know, there's 50,000 teachers in Scotland, but hopefully we've, we've managed to get in contact with the, you know, three or 400, you know, people who registered who are particularly interested in this issue. It, it might be that you, the, the people watching this or listening to this back as a podcast, might be the person in the school that needs to take on this work. And and it doesn't matter really. Well, it does matter, but you need to be aware. You need to be aware. But if you're a white teacher or a non-white teacher, um, there's something I think maybe heroic is a big word in it, but there's something very important about doing that work um, and maybe challenging colleagues. And that that's something we haven't really spoken about. But, um, you know, outside the classroom and when you're discussing policy and things in schools and, and the way that the school runs, that's a really tricky issue. Um, but something to think about, maybe rather than talk about anymore. Um, Thank you, um, uh, uh, Nav and Melina. And um, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm glad we ran on because I, I think there was so much to talk about and so much more to talk about. Um, I'm looking at the comments and, and there are you know hundreds of comments we haven't managed to get to, especially people asking questions about how to do this work at, um, at primary stage, you know, which is is, is tricky um, potentially, but there are ways through it. And, and hopefully we'll be able to get to those questions. Um, we will be posting up a big reading list as well. If you follow us on Twitter and subscribe, um, I'll be sending out through the emails as well if you registered on Eventbrite. And um, please do follow the Anti-Racist Educator um, and the Vein on um, Twitter. Um, it really is a great place for discussions. It, it can be a wonderful environment. It can be a toxic environment on Twitter, um, but uh, it, it is worthwhile. Um, and I'll just talk really quickly about SAIT really quickly, um, but I'm gonna say goodbye to you guys. Thank you so much for the talk today. Um, and thank you for giving up your time during um, uh, your uh, annual leave and <laughs> summer holidays. Um, really, really important. So um, goodbye to you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tom. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you. That's great. So really quickly, thank you for joining us today, everyone. Thank you for watching our session um, with SAIT, the Scottish Education, the Scottish Association for the Teaching of English. And um, we're hoping to have a lot more events just like this one, though I can't see how we can beat that one, um, coming up on things like set texts, but also different approaches in the classroom, different approaches to literacy. Um, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll get um, reminders and recommendations whenever we're going live. If you follow us on Facebook at um, SAIT, um, you will be getting information there as well. If you like us on Twitter, we're, we're very active on Twitter and you'll find out other things um, first there. Um, we have an event potentially coming up on behavior management with Raymond Soltisek, so look out for that. Um, you can also look at his previous event on reading for understanding analysis and evaluation um, by looking through the YouTube playlist. And we also have an event um, that I led on blended learning using um, uh, G Suite, so Google products. So we're building up a little library of our different CPD. If you want to put it on your um, your PRD report for the GCCS, that is a very Scottish education comment. You are welcome to, um, and we hope to see you at our next event. So please remember to like and subscribe, and we will see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>